Welcome to our Rutgers Business School faculty and staff town hall, Actions Matter, Valuing Opinions and Differences. My name is Sharon Leiden. I've been at Rutgers for over 15 years. I'm the Associate Dean of Alumni and Corporate Engagement. Thank you to you, our faculty and staff, for joining us today. I'm delighted to be speaking with Pat David. Pat retired from J.P. Morgan Chase as a Senior Diversity Advisor, where she worked for over eight years. Prior to joining J.P. Morgan Chase, she worked at Citi and Merrill Lynch. We were introduced to Pat by Nancy D. Tommaso. Pat has spoken in many of Nancy's classes on leadership, diversity, and inclusion topics. In addition, Pat is currently involved with Lisa Kaplowitz's and the Center for Women in Business as a senior mentor. Also, Pat's daughter graduated from Rutgers. Before we begin, it's my honor to introduce Rutgers Business School, Dean Lay. A few months ago, Dean Lay asked if I would lead a faculty and staff town hall on diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Dean Lay, for gathering us together to discuss this topic as educators in the classroom. Thank you, Sharon. I want to say thank you all for joining us at this important inaugural event of the RBS faculty staff town hall meeting series on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are all the full-time faculty and staff member of Rutgers Business School. However, we are also citizens of a larger global environment and community where many people are involved in the fight for equality, in the fight against the COVID pandemic, and in the fight for inclusion, and so much more around the world. We are not just a large, long-standing, and a prominent public business school on the East Coast. We are also, more importantly, a business school with a purpose. And we value what our knowledge, program offerings, and our effort, joint effort, can do to impact and benefit others in the most meaningful way. At RBS, we all know we have our brand defined by four R's, resilient, resourceful, responsible, and reinventing ourselves for the digital era. But keep in mind, underpinning all these R's, there is another R, a very important one, that has always, always been defined our character, characteristics of RBS. That is respect. Respect each other, is exactly what today's focus will echo. Value opinions and the differences as Sharon announced. I'm very pleased to have Patricia David to join us. I also want to use this opportunity to say thank you, Nancy. Nancy D. Tommaso introduced Patricia to us. And uh, it's a good opportunity for us to have Patricia. I also want to share with you that uh, before Patricia joined J.P. Morgan Chase, Patricia was with the city, Solomon Brother, and Merrill Lynch as a business executive with increasing responsibilities. And she is also the recipient of a 2002 YMCA Black Achievers in Industry Award. And she's also the recipient of 2005 YWCA Women Achievers Award. And she has also been featured in quite a number of diversity publications. So we are very happy to have you, Patricia, and welcome to Business School to give us, uh, to lead us at today's town hall. And also, I'm going to turn the program now to Sharon, and um, who will be our facilitator for today's event. Sharon and her team worked very hard to make this event a successful one. Thank you, Sharon. Back to you. 
Thank you, Dean Lay. Thank you for your leadership and initiating this very important session and topic. So I wanted to share the format for today. So you will all be on mute. We're using Zoom webinar. Pat and I have a list of questions that we're going to, I'm going to ask her and we'll be speaking for about 30 minutes. Then we're gonna conduct a polling question to all of you to kind of get the pulse of our conversation. And you have uh, also the, the ability to add questions and answers in the Q&A section at the bottom of Zoom. And this was very important. So when Dean Lay, uh, Nancy and I and Pat discussed this, we wanted to make sure that there was anonymity. So you can ask Q&A questions and that will be anonymous. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to make sure everybody's okay. Um, you can add some things in the chat if you'd like. We have the comments available if you'd like to make any comments into the chat. All right. So, Pat, thank you so much for being here today. I really feel honored uh, that Dean Lay asked me to uh, facilitate this session because I had the honor of getting to know you better and we've had several conversations. I'm really interested to hear your perspective and I'm excited for you to share your perspective with the faculty and staff here today. So my first question is, people seem to be stressed. It's been about six months since we've been living with the challenges of the pandemic, which requires us to be socially distant from people, which doesn't seem normal because we're such social beings. We've been living with the uncertainty of the economy and many people are hurting from the loss of work. We see people protesting injustice, uh, which erupted with the death of George Floyd, but there seems to be more and more happening. There seems to be very strong divisions among people and people feel very passionate about their point of view. As educators, so we're faculty in the classroom and we're staff that are virtual how do we facilitate difficult conversations in our virtual classroom and our virtual interaction with students? Yeah, thank you, Sharon. First, I just want to thank Dean Lay. <clears throat> I want to thank Sharon and Nancy and Lisa and anyone that was involved in, you know, getting me to participate in this, which I think is just awesome. Um, I, I, I think it's good for uh, academic institutions to take the lead on this conversation. And you might know this already, but a lot of other colleges that I've been working with and hearing about are doing something similar. Uh, so I say, you know what, that's a, that's a thumbs up. Um, but I think just based upon your question, so here's the good news. Technology eliminates distance, so we're able to have the conversation, right? There's no excuse anymore, right? Like it or not, uh, technology allows us to be able to interact with people, no matter where we are, 24-7, it doesn't matter. You can reach more people, but the key is the messages and the signals that we're sending through technology, and I think sometimes and I think everybody you know, who's alive in the world today, um, social media, sometimes the signals are not good signals. And it's, you know, bad news travels faster than good news. And it's, uh, you know, the headline is what kind of gets people to react to certain things without really thinking in terms of what's really behind that and what's the truth. Uh, I watch the news today and I don't even know what I'm learning anymore. Uh, you know, so I turn it to cartoons or something, but uh, the messages are very difficult to follow. But the fact that this conversation is starting, you know, let's say subsequent to George Floyd being dead and, you know, in the last week, Breonna Taylor's, um, you know, outcome. However people are feeling today is how they were always feeling. Now there's a way to express it, either anonymously or directly. And I think so to me, that's not new. It's just now we know how people are feeling. You, you, there's no escape uh, how people are feeling. Um, you cannot turn it off even if you try. Even if you turn your phone off, you're still getting messages 24-7. Uh, but I think the key is, and you all are starting this, which I think is great, you have to communicate. You have to be brave enough to say, let's take a pause and acknowledge the issue. So whatever the issue is today, whatever the issue is next week, you have to acknowledge it. And going back to the, the, your, your moral compass, the R's that Dr. Lay talked about, resilience, resourceful, reinvent yourself through the digital age, and responsibility and respect, I felt like I was talking to Jamie Dimon from the JP Morgan Chase because he says the same things. And those are the compass marks that keeps you sane. And so you have to acknowledge the issue, agree on whatever it is you're talking about. I spoke to Sharon 
And I said, well, do we even know what we're talking about? When people say race, do people know what they're saying? When people say you're discriminatory, what do you mean by that? No one actually defines it, but we all jump at it, right? We all jump at it. You have to facilitate a conversation. You really do. And you have to be brave about it. You've got to get support. So let's say today in this example, I'm the support to help you. You have to be able to identify one to two specific actionable things because matters, you know, words are great, but the actions is what's going to, you know, re reside in history, right? Uh, and which this is the important part. You have to repeat it. You have to repeat it. Like you want to get your muscles right, or you want to get your, uh, your rhythm right. You want to get this to be so routine. Whereas I mentioned to Sharon this morning, if a year from now, another situation occurs that kind of fits in the race box, but not like the George Floydson. You have to be ready to handle that versus, gee, what are we going to do? And so I think you need to practice this thing over and over. So the moderated conversations, I think, are great. You have to set up ground rules for whatever that is going to be. And you have to establish what are the decided outcomes? What, you know, what would be different for you to know that something worked? You know, my father always said, you have to know what's going to happen before you decide, right? And so I ask you all to think about, hmm. What is it that would be different for you to feel as though, you know what, that's, that's progress. So you have to have that conversation. But you also have to give people a place to be heard and to listen. And one of the, one of the relevant um, points that I mentioned to Sharon, and this is something that I follow maybe 30, 35 years now, is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the, the seven habits, which I hold to me all the time, is seek to understand, not to be understood. So if you're having a conversation that someone and you are, uh, you know, have a difference of opinion with, don't just start to put your opinion in that person's head. You should take a step back and say, gee, how is it that that person feels that way? Maybe their life experience, their values, where they were born, what they believe in. And to do that, you literally have to be open to the possibility that you might actually be wrong. You might actually be the one that needs to change. But you can't do that if you're going to go in there and start to just bear your your, your views and values on this other person or this other group. So I, I would ask you all, it's okay to disagree, but it has to be done respectfully. And as educators, Pete, Pat David, Pat David, citizen of the world, I hold educators to a higher standard because kids listen to you. You might not think they do, but they will listen to you because people believe that educators are worldly. They have all this knowledge. They have access to everything. So you should be able to articulate and educate and help all those kids that are coming to your classroom or being on Zoom with how to handle this conversation and be brave about it, even if you don't know all the answers. Uh, I remember someone said to me, just be one day ahead of the class. If you're one day ahead of the class, then that's a good step in the right direction. So I would urge you all to say, you know what? We also might be in the pool of the, of the inertia of all the nonsense, but when we put our foot on a Rutgers property, when we put our Rutgers jackets on, we cannot be like the city. We have to be above that. And we have to bear that. I call it a burden because it's, it's a teaching moment. We have to bear that burden. So that's how I would, uh, re, you know, basically uh, give you feedback on your first question. Thank you. Um, and Pat, I really appreciate you making me feel so comfortable to ask some difficult questions. Um, so personally, I think people are afraid to discuss difficult topics because we do not know if what we say might offend someone if we do not mean to hurt anyone's feelings. We're hearing more about the term white privilege and as a white person who tries to be aware but may not be aware of my white privilege, how can I support my African American colleagues learn and grow without avoiding the conversation completely because I don't want to be considered a racist or I, the last thing in the world I want to do is offend anybody. And you know, there's a lot of that going around, right? So if you look at you and I, people say you're a white woman and I'm not. You're white looking and I'm black looking. But one of the things I didn't tell you is my mother's mother's Irish. My name is Patricia because my parents' family's from Ireland. My father's family's French. So I speak a broken, I speak Patois. Uh, my daughter looks like a person from Persia. My sister's very fair skin. I have a niece who's whiter than you. If you line us up, you're like, wait a second, what happened? Are these people from a lab or something? You know, like, what's the experiment? So, and when I came to this country, I was born in England. I'm from the West Indies. My parents did not um, assimilate and define ourselves as black people. It was almost, don't you dare, because we're Caribbean. We're from Dominica. We're from the French West Indies. We have a culture. And, you know, when we came here in the 60s, to be black in America was not a good thing. That being said, 
you grew up in the Caribbean, you don't know color. All you know is your culture, you know, the food, the music, the religion. And so, so that's kind of in my body, right? Um, but white privilege is something that if I, if you and I walked into the same store, there are places where someone would say, can I help you miss? And they would look at me as if I'm going to take something. And, you know, I could get upset about that, or I could say, you know what, let them, let me show them that I belong in that store and I'm not going to take something. But you as a white woman, for you to feel like you don't want to offend anybody because you don't know even what to do. Like, you know, is it black? Is it African? Like, what's the term in America? Because if you go overseas, it's okay to say Negro. It's okay to say Negro. It's okay to say black. It, all these things, are, you know, so when we have this conversation, let's not forget about the fact that U.S. is a little part of this thing called the world and the world comes to America, right? So it all depends on who you feel like you're offending. But one of the things that I would say to you is admit your vulnerability. I always tell somebody, answer the question before you're asked. So how would that play out? If you and I have a conversation, you're like, gee, I don't want to respect her, but I still want to talk to her about this project or whatever is real, but I don't know how to, huh? You say, you know what? I don't want to offend you. And I want to make sure that nothing that I say is going to do. So put it out there first before you let the person kind of draw it out of you because then you're on the defense. And I think you all know what's the, be what's the best defense is a good offense, right? So you have to be vulnerable enough. And the way you do that is you make sure you might be blacker than me. I might be whiter than you in, the, in my mind versus in my color, right? It is what it is. So don't judge, listen, ask for help to be better. So ask somebody, say, you know, Pat, um, I, I had actually a senior woman at J.P. Morgan Chase. I won't tell you who she was. I was sitting in her office and we were going through some diversity data. This was years ago. And she was really trying. So she looks at me. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the data. And she looked at me and she puts her hand on my hand like this. And I'm thinking, okay, what's going to happen now? Right? And she said to me, I have a question for you. I said, what's your question? And she said, is it Black or African American? And so what I did was I put my hand on top of hers and I said, well, is it white or Caucasian? My point is, I kind of wanted her to know it goes both ways. Just like you might not know if you should call me black or African-American, I want to know, do you want to be called white or Caucasian? So my point is, whatever you're feeling goes both ways. It's not just, a, it's not just this group, it's both groups. White people feel it, black people feel it brown people. Now we have brown people, red people. How many colors of the people are there anyhow? I don't even know anymore. But the last thing I would say on this point is share your story. If you tell somebody who you are, not what you look like, that opens up a whole different possibility. You might be connected to somebody more than you think, but if you just look at the color to be the bar of what you decide is different, you're going to lose 24-7. And so share your story. So hi, my name is Sharon. I want to make sure that before I, you know, I'm a little vulnerable about this pop topic, but how about if I share a little bit about myself? Because you know my family's from here and I like to do these things and here's my hobbies. And I, you know, and the next thing you know, oh my God, you like country music too? So do I. I actually do like country music as a black female, but what are you gonna do? Uh, but I, I say that to get the color out of the way and find out, well, who is behind that color? Who is Sharon? Because to me, that's the exciting part. Who are you now? What do you look like? Yes. So Pat, what, what I also see is that inevitably, I'm going off the script. That's okay. <laughs> Come on, bring it. Okay, inevitably. I don't need my classes for my notes. Come on, bring it. <laughs> inevitably, there's going to be these topics that come up in the classroom. Yes. It could be politics. It yes. could be race. Uh, it could be the economy that people have very strong feelings or, or you know, or divisive yes. feelings, very divided. Yes, yes. How do we as educators facilitate this discussion in the classroom? And usually it's fun, you know, corporate America has the same conundrum. There's always three topics that are gonna be the lightning storm. Politics, religion, and sports. Trust me, those three, you're gonna get people to pull against each other like you have never seen before. But I say to you is, be able to appreciate that someone, the exciting thing for me, talking to somebody is, gee, I wonder how different we are and I wonder how the same we are. So I would say to you that the educators can try this and pick a topic in the classroom, any topic. You know, why do some people like ketchup versus mustard? Why do some people like this show versus that show? And some people feel so strongly about different, why do you like the Yankees versus whatever the thing is? And say, before the class is over, let's have a conversation with two people who are completely opposite on the ends of a topic that is, that is real and let's at least find out where we diverge. And at that moment, 
you've made progress because now you understand why that person feels different or thinks different. And it could be anything from, think about my life experience, where I came from versus what you think I look like. And, I, the, and this is part of the whole Stephen Covey seven habits thing, by the way, right? For me to appreciate why you and I diverge, he says, you have to walk in someone else's shoes. And what's the first thing you have to do to walk in someone's shoes? You have to take your shoes off. You cannot wear two shoes at the same time which means you have to be open-minded to listen and appreciate, even though we're done and I say, boy, I still disagree with her, but now I understand why. Because as educators, you know better than anybody, knowledge is power. If you disagree just because that's a head fake, you've lost, you failed, leave the class, it's over. But if you believe because now you have knowledge, and Jamie Dimon always said, read something from somebody that is different than you. Re you know, watch the news of, of a group that you don't like and at least speak with, a, with knowledge versus just, well, I don't like you because, really? How do you, how do you grow like that? So I would say to you, um, the educators can actually try that out. And I think it'll give you a, a routine, it'll, it'll stretch a muscle, it'll give you some habits to at least let the students know that there's a safe place for us to learn how to talk even though we disagree. Because one day those kids, when I'm sitting on a beach with a, you know, a little funny look, uh, you know, drink with a, a little, you know, nice palm tree of my head, they're going to be running the joint. So please make sure you teach them not just to follow the herd because the herd gets slaughtered every time. The herd gets slaughtered. The people who are protesting, you have to wonder, have they really stepped back and thought about why is there a difference? And if they, they at least understand it, you can still protest, but now you know why versus just joining the herd. And I think we have too much of that going on. Thank you. I really appreciate you allowing me to Ask the question. Go for it. Um, so, how do we bring this to life? Uh, you know, Lay talks about the three R's, and I, you know, I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I remember two and not three. I'm, I forget that third one. So, resilience, responsibility, resourcefulness, and then she added one: reinventing in the digital age. Right. How do we make it scalable? How do we bring this to life as educators? I tell you, I feel like I'm reliving my J.P. Morgan Chase days because Jamie Dimon, this had to be about five or six years ago. This was maybe even longer, actually, after the financial crisis. We wanted to establish what he would call how we do business. And, and if you Google J.P. Morgan Chase, you'll see that we have rules on how we do business. Just those words alone is something that we used on a daily basis. So, for example, the way you bring it alive, and, and my, my example will be on the J.P. Morgan Chase side, when, when we would sit there and talk uh, at a town hall, or if we would be in a conversation, or if we would be doing a performance review for somebody, we would say, that's not how we do business. Or we would say, you know what, that's exactly, we would repeat that word in every sentence, every moment, every chance we got where it made sense. And so I say, think about the four R's. How is it that you all can repeat the language throughout your, you use what, 10,000 words a day? Use those a couple of times. And it's when you start the class. I remember when I was in school, we used to do the, was it the Pledge of Allegiance? And that became like this thing every day that you just did. And it just became part of who you were and you kind of grew into it. And so what's stopping the professors, the educators, the teachers from starting a class by saying, you know what, you know, we know what the agenda is for today's class, but let's continue to focus on one of the four of us today and let's talk, focus on resilience for this class we're gonna to do today. Cause this, this, this class is either very difficult or very easy. And the resilience is one that maybe if we think about that as we're going through the, the curriculum and the, and the agenda, it'll help us focus more. Or you know what? Let's talk about resourcefulness. Many of you have to write a dissertation or a book report. And when I think of that word, that means I'm going to do everything in my power to find everything that I need to know to get this book report done. So I'm going to be resourceful. I'm going to use, I'm going to research. In the old days, my generation, maybe some of yours, we had to go to a place called a library to get information. Today, people just type it in 24 seven, but how resourceful are they really with using all those tools to help them become more learned, if you will, in the classroom and responsibility and respect. So I say to you, use that as part of your language. So I'm assuming that you all, when you sit with a student, maybe in college, you don't do this, but you know, when you sit with a student uh, at the end of the year and you go through their, how they did, you could say, you know what, you really did great, Joey. You were resilient. You were very resourceful. And I see that you don't have clicks and you respected your colleagues when they ask questions. But if you start to put that in your daily language, that'll become your mantra. And I would, I would say to you, just start doing that like today. 
just start doing that because then it's just, it's not like something that's new. And then a year from now, six months from now, 10 years from now, when the world has other challenges, you can always go back to your moral compass because that's been part of your frame. Put it on your documents, you know, um, respectfully yours, resilience today or something. You just put it everywhere where people see it. That's what we did at JP Morgan Chase. So the how we do business thing is a thing that carries you good and a bad time. You know, I think Dean Lay has done a really good job. You know, it's in the classrooms, you know, when we're physically there, it's in the back of the classroom. Yeah. But I think that you raised a really good point about having us start to use well, yeah. it in the classroom. And um, I, I could do a better job. I know that. Well, think about it. You're how many? 300 more voices, right? You know, Dean mm -hmm. Lay talks to 300, um, you know, uh, professors, 300 professors talk to 10,000 students, right? Mm -hmm. So just, and, and when you all, uh, I don't know if you're on board or if you all um, uh, have- Yeah, we have orientations. We have yeah. orientations and, and onboarding. All of this, all of this, all of this. And when somebody goes afoul of your moral compass, just like we did at J. Morgan Chase, you say, you know, that's not how we do business. You know, that's not one of our four R's. That's not how we respect. It. Like you just, you use that as your, and people are like, oh yeah, that's right. That's not how we do it. There's no confusion. But if you allow people to, you know, I say name it, then claim it, right? And then aim for it, right? So you got to define it. Just like when people say race, what are they saying? What are, we, what are they really saying, right? When someone's actually trying to change racism in the dictionary because the definition is very is not um current enough in her mind mm -hmm. you know and i mm -hmm. said you know, maybe she's got a point there because it was so narrow back in the day where people thought that that was going to be the life forever and all mm -hmm. of a sudden now the world is flat people are like this and there's like gee what are you well i'm a quarter of this and i'm a third of that and I'm, what does all that mean i'm a human person i got blood just red just like you that's what it should mean right but very true to, as 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 educators i think you all are in a unique position to take your values and your voices and put that into the students' heads so they can carry it into their communities in their homes and their towns. So important. So Pat, we are about 30 minutes into our conversation and I'm gonna take a leap of faith and I'm going to uh, launch uh, our first polling question. And the question is, is this conversation relevant? Um, so I, you know, you have yes, no, and not sure. Do I get to vote? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking for um, a hundred percent response rate. I'm looking at, yeah, there. We're at 73? Oh yeah, 75 out of 96. I have a 78% response rate. A little bit more. Okay, good. Can you see it? I think we're up to 83%. Answers or anything? Can you see it? I can what? see. Oh, you can? Uh, yeah, yeah. We have another 10 people left to vote. Yes. So, so we, we have about 89% yes, 4% no, and 8% not sure. It's all good. Okay, good. Good. So, so look, oh, Karen, I'm not offended. This, so this is not hurting or helping my feelings. I, this, so people should vote honestly versus, oh boy, she's on the screen. What is she going to think? It's not about me. It's about me giving my service to the school. That's great. So I'm going to, I'm going to share results. So we see that. And I have a second question. So I'm hoping that I can launch it again successfully. Hmm. I don't know how I get that other question. So I, mine says stop sharing. So if I say stop sharing, will that change something? No, I don't think the relaunch polling. Let's see if I get. Hmm. I had a second question. Ten is now viewing questions. So question one is still in. Oh, it has ten seconds left. It has eleven seconds left for people. To oh, vote. you think that's why it's taking? Uh, fifteen, sixteen. Out, uh, no, it's going up. Going up. Oh, so the next question. Hmm. I don't know how to go. Oh, maybe I hit the drop down. Oh, yeah. Here, here's the next question. Okay. Oh, right, here's the next question. From this conversation, is this practical advice? Yes, no, maybe.
So we have about 65% voting, 70%. It will bring me great joy to be at 100% voted. <laughs> So we're at 80%. So a few more people. Okay, so I'm gonna end polling, share results. So we have 57% uh, yes, 6% say no, and 37% maybe. All right. So I'm gonna stop sharing results. Um, according to Dean Lay, she said the chat does work. Uh, so let's see if the chat works. And we wanted to just get your thoughts on, please provide um, any comments or thoughts that you have. And I think we have 11 questions, I think. Yeah. Oh, chat seems to be disabled. Is that, I think people are saying chat is disabled. Yeah, okay. I was hoping that- oh, It's um, working now. It's working now? Um, I'm glad to see this conversation is happening. Somebody, yeah, I see chats when I go further down the screen. Uh, can you see the chat? Oh, the Q&A, the Q&A, I'm sorry. Oh, the Q&A, yeah, the chat seems to be disabled and we can't get it back, but okay, so let's, Let's take some of the questions that we have. Yep. Sharon, um, our OTs, I think they fixed the chat, chat now. It works okay. now. I said okay. send one. Yeah. Okay. So Pat, I'm gonna um, look at the questions that we have here. Um, and then when, when somebody's sending a question, if they want, they can send it anonymously by clicking the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, within the chat, send anos anonymously. Okay, so I have an anonymous question. There is definitely a power dynamic within a university, students to faculty, staff to administrators, where do we draw the line between understanding and respecting other opinions and ensuring our students, parentheses, particularly marginalized groups, mm -hmm. end parentheses, feel safe and supported over the opinions of those in positions of power? For example, isn't it part of the faculty, staff, and administrator's job to create a self and welcoming environment to students to learn? Yeah, you want me to answer that? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny. I think there are so many parallels with what this question uh, is getting behind and a work environment because it's the, we have similar situations. You have very senior people. I don't know if you heard yesterday what Charlie Scharf said at Wells Fargo. He used to work with us at J.P. Morgan Chase, and he basically had a, a session with senior black folk. And he said something as simple as, you know, there's not there's a lack of talent in the black community. That doesn't sit well with people who are black and talented. Uh, just because you can't find them doesn't mean that they don't exist. And he had actually apologized because as a senior leader, his voice carries. His voice carries so far so that um, in the black professional community, there is now people saying, you know what, I don't think I want to work there. I don't want to bank there. And that guy doesn't get it. Like that done, <laughs> you know? And so I say you unfortunately have to be that, you have to be better than that. Um, and, and I think if, if you believe that your role, and it is, to create a safe environment for people who are marginalized. That could be people with disabilities, people who are gay, uh, you know, people who are vertically challenged, whatever, whatever the group is that is the minority in terms of power and, and exercise and authority. I think you have to provide those people with a safe place to have a conversation. So you understand what is it that they're feeling because let's say that there are 10 students in that community of marginalized students and you address them in this semester and you say, check in the box, good, everybody's fine. Guess what? The semester after that's going to be 10 other students. So how do you create a rhythm and a routine and a culture where you don't always have to pull the people in? Because on the other side of that coin at Citigroup, they tried to bring in senior black talent to have a conversation. And those people said, don't you dare. Don't make it where I have to solve the problem. Figure it out yourself. So you'll never be right, but you have to try something and be brave enough for the outcome. But I, I applaud the person who asked the question, but I think you need to say it. 
So just like we talked about the four R's, what is preventing this, the, the faculty from you know, agreeing and locking arms and saying, we have to demand a safe space for people who feel marginalized? It could even be white people. It doesn't matter who they are. And I think if you say it, then what you have to do is when you see that that is not happening in the bathrooms, in the cafeteria, in the hall, or how someone says something that is like, hey, wait a minute, you got to call it out right at the moment. You can't say, hey, last week in that meeting, you said so-and-so and it wasn't appropriate. You got to say, you know what? That's not appropriate right this moment. And be brave enough to do it on the spot. Because if you're not, then you're not creating that safe space. Because that other person was saying to you, that was your moment to call it out and you did it. And that's where the bravery comes in by the faculty. So I, I, I applaud the person who asked the question. But to me, just like we did in corporate America, you have to do it on the spot. Thank you. We have another question. Do you think RBS should offer some unconscious bias training for the staff to help us work on our implicit biases, settle behaviors, and change the mindset of modern racism and new racism? So if you polled any self-respecting diversity officer in corporate America that actually managed a global firm, they would tell you training doesn't do anything. It's a check in the box. That being said, what people... The, the, the one program that I launched when I left, it was with a company called, uh, it was a scientific, uh, it was a scientific um, how your brain works kind of diversity training. It wasn't basic diversity training. It was, there was, it was science-based and I completely forget the name of the company of all these things. I can send it to you later, Sharon, if you. Mm -hmm. if you uh, mm -hmm. But the point that that training talked about is you have to name it, you have to be brave enough to change it and you have to action it. And that's where a lot of companies fall down because guess what? Many people, students and faculty, workers and managers, all they want to do is go to work and work and come home. They don't want to have this conversation. Mm. As much as you want to have it, mm. they don't want to talk about it because they don't mm. think you, uh, either they understand it or they just say, you know what, can't I just, because every time you talk about it, guess what? And this was my experience. I felt marginalized, even as a senior person, because someone's talking about it. Like, can you stop talking about it already? Can I just come and do my job and collect my paycheck and go home? Mm. If, you, if you bring mm. it up and you're not equipped to maintain the conversation, mm. the person that loses is that marginalized person all the time. Mm. But there are a lot of, uh, there's a Harvard uh, tool out there where you can actually go and do your own self-assessment, uh, answer these questions, and it'll tell you based upon your answers, Hey, do you know you had a blind spot for people who are fat? Did you know you have a blind spot for people who are short? You know, and so if you want to do those self-assessments, that's a great way. But I would ask you, if you really want to improve and be better than your score or how you, uh, your results, one of the things it tells you to do is I'll say to Sharon, hey, Sharon, you know what? I just kind of did the self-assessment. And I know I have this bias to people who are fat that are eating. And I want you to help me get better at that. So if you ever see me in a, in a situation where I'm going to, you know, you need to call it out. That's how you become brave. Mm -hmm. You can't do this alone. And that science uh, uh, diversity training that we did at J. Morgan Chase says you cannot do it because guess what? Science says you cannot identify your own bias. It's impossible. You can't. It technically is impossible. So if you are brave enough to identify your shortcomings, someone else has to do it for you. And you have to be brave enough to say, okay, I'm going to change. If you not wanted to do that, then diversity training is a head fake. Mm -hmm. I have this question, great advice. Um, we want more. We also, so the, the question is, we also have to address issues of inequality. How do we begin that journey? Yeah, so one of the things that I said earlier is having this time with you all is a starting point. It's the beginning of a journey uh, because the people who are gonna be in the school tomorrow, the, everything's gonna be changing. It's not like you have a fixed community for five years, like a cohort. So. I would say you want to have these conversations more often and in smaller bites. Like if the next time you all talk about this is six months from now, it's too late. So what's stopping you to say, you know what, let's just do a quick 30 minutes, pick a topic, let's kind of run through it. We want to continue that, do it again next month, we want to continue it. But put together some sort of a, 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 a portfolio. And these topics are topics that it, it took 100 years to kind of get to us where we are. So it's not going to be like, hey, one and done, okay, got that next question. That's not happening here, folks. These are very difficult topics on a good day. And so, you know, you could say, here are the topics, poll the faculty, which are the top we want to kind of really get our arms around and do something for. 
what would we look to say is progress? Let's agree on what that is before we go jump in the poll, pool here. And let us say we can all spare 30 minutes a week, a quarter, a month, and let's put together that, that, that schedule, if you will, where we can say, you know what, let's take a topic and let's have one or two of the faculty, so not Sharon, not me, not Dr. Lay, Professor Dean Lay. Let's, let's, what's the thing you wanna kind of talk about? But remember the guardrails. Think you have to listen to understand versus to be understood. So what is it that you wanna know about racism? What is it that you wanna do? What do you wanna try? And if this was corporate America, we would do that, but then we would say, okay, let's say we agree that we wanna make this one change. Let's do that change in the next three months and let's see if the outcome is giving us what we want. Like, let's actually do it as a group. So if we want to change increased representation of women, it's May. We know we're going to promote people by, by December. Let's start to hire more women. Okay, great. Actionable. You can track it. You can measure it. So you have to be that deliberate, if you're really serious about making a change that is scalable and repeatable. So when you all leave, it still works. If you really want to change the school and the culture and the fabric, it should work when you leave, not just because you're there. That's great. Thank you. That was a great question. Thank you very much. So we do have the chat working. And one of the questions that we have were just comments and thoughts. So maybe this might be a good time just to get some uh, thoughts or comments uh, from you, the faculty and staff. So um, a comment that we have is social inequities are reproduced across generations. Having the conversation now is awesome and will afford us the positive change we seek for the future. Um, another uh, or just question we're getting also as a comment is should these town hall meetings include students in the future? And I, I yeah, I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, also too, we are going to have a future series of different town halls. This one is with faculty and staff. October 21st um, is with Carolyn Johnson, this, uh, the CEO of Diversity Inc. And that's with our alumni, and she's an EMBA alum. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna have another one with students uh, later on in late October, early November. And we, when we did these conversations, if you will, at Jim Morgan Chase, we did it right after the Dallas police got shot how many years mm -hmm. ago. And we called our series, which still runs today, Global Voices. And we brought in people, different people from the outside. We brought in people on the inside. We brought in students. And it was a place, let's just talk. Let's be brave enough to talk and listen, talk and listen, talk and listen, talk and listen. And I say that because it's still happening today. So that, that rhythm is still helping the company through the Brianna Taylors, through the George Floyd. Because guess what? Employees in that company live in those towns employees in that company have family who are police. Like there's this thing, right? So don't assume that it's just, people are not just, I guess I'm black and I'm this group. No, there's mm -hmm. a whole string of things around a person's mm -hmm. experience in their life that you have to acknowledge. And guess mm -hmm. what? They bring that to the classroom. They bring that happy or positive or anger to the classroom, to the reports, to the questions, to the work that they do. And they become part of your culture. So you've got, you've got to create that environment. And that's a lot of work, but it's great work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, I have a lot of uh, questions that I, I want to cover too. So uh, another question is, how do you deal with accusations of you or someone else are only here as an affirmative action hire? Oh, yeah. That's, 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 that comes that's up hurtful. for colleges. And that's also a corporate thing because there's laws around that in the United States, right? So hopefully people know when they, you know what affirmative action means? It actually means affirmatively showing the job is available to anybody. That's what that means. That's it. That word affirmative is you have to prove to the government that you've affirmatively put these jobs in places where people in different groups would never see them before, but now they can. That's what that means. But people use that term in a way that they don't understand. Oh, you must be an affirmative. Well, like, what the hell does that mean? Like, you think I'm high because I'm black? If that was the case, you tell that person, if that was the case, I guess I didn't have to go to an interview. If that was the case, why do you need my resume? If you would just hire me because I'm brown, why all the drama? Just bring me in and bring my cousins and my uncles and my aunts in. So you have to remind people that everybody has to go through the same process. So even though you found me because I'm black and that's why I'm on the slate, I still have to perform to get that job. And you have to make sure people know that. So you as an institution need to make sure that you take that myth away. Because if you don't, the person that looks like they were that hire is carrying a heavy bag for four years. But you have to call it out. And that's mm -hmm. what I said to J. Morgan Chase. I said, if anybody 
And then I, I went on to, so far to say, if anybody at the firm felt that they were hired because of the color of their skin or because they were female or whatever, you let me know and I'll talk to that manager myself. You have to be that bold to tell them that's not how we do business. Mm. Mm. Right? You have to honor that. But if you're going to just say, well, blah, 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 then shame on you. But you got to put your foot down. Right? Mm -hmm. You got to define it so people know what it is because people throw these words around as if they're the expert and they're not. Thank you. So yeah. I'm going through from the top to the bottom the questions that we've been asked. And um, this, this question is, I do not think we have done enough as a university to be anti-racist and fight white supremacy. We need to name those things and be intentional in our efforts to address them. Instead, I see a lot of pro-diversity. Diversity is lovely, but has been corrupted in many ways to avoid tackling the real issues of anti-Black racism and white supremacy. How can we push the needle in that direction throughout Rutgers Business School? The key, you have to define it. So there were a lot of words that people, you just used. We could say, okay, go into everybody's secret compartment and type in what you think these words meant. And everybody's gonna have a different view and it's right for them. So you have to define, when I used to work at JP Morgan Chase, I would say diversity means talent. So when you hear the firm use that word, it has nothing to do with nothing, it means talent. Meaning we're gonna go everywhere to find it. We're gonna look under a rock to find a talented person, right? And I think you need to define those words because the 96 people on the call just heard those words and everybody had a different reaction, right? And so how do you make a decision if there's no conversation around what you mean, right? Diversity means race, it means social inequities, it means you know, where you are in the poll, what side of the street you were born on. And people use these words like, oh, like oh, oh, as an institution, you should live and breathe on definition. You should live and breathe on defining it. So maybe you take all these words and you all say, you know what, let's make sure when people hear a Rutgers professor use that word, here's what we at Rutgers means. And that's a good homework assignment, by the way, because there's no confusion. And you almost have to say it. Hey, folks, when you hear us say that word, here's what we're talking about versus, gee, I wonder what they're saying, right? I think so. You know, another, I go back to my Jake Morgan Chase days. Executive leadership, we say 80% is doing the work. 20% is just learning about it. But it's, it's like I could learn about how to stay healthy, but unless I go onto that Peloton or Echelon, whatever's on sale now, and I do my do, and I feel it in my bones, I could tell you how to stay healthy, but unless I'm physically doing it, it doesn't stay with me. It doesn't, it's not part of my vernacular. It doesn't come out of my mouth. And so I say to you, well, you have to feel it. it you you got to feel these words, if you will, and start to say it in a way where, you know, I say, they go, did I just say black? Oh my God, was that my mouth? Like, you got to get comfortable around this stuff. And the more you repeat it, just like as an educator, as you would tell a student, repeat, communicate, repeat, com it's the same muscle. Just apply those same skills to this topic. It's just that the topic is like, ah, you know, but if ever, imagine if everybody just, ah, you know, how are we going to learn? How are we going to learn if everybody's kind of walked away, right? So someone needs to be brave enough. And as 96 people, you are already have a, hey, you know what? If we link together, it's like the Transformers. When you put three of them together, they become this big machine, but you all have to link together and agree on what we're going to go forward on. Mm. Right? That's a great question, by the way. Yeah. So I have a very, uh, another interesting question. So what is the most important lesson you learned from Jamie Dimon? You know, he always said, it, it, it's basic. Answer a phone call, you know, uh, respond to a text, just respect people. And if you're going to sell a product, imagine if you had to sell it to your mother, would that be the right product that you're going to sell? It's not all about making money. And that's why JP Morgan Chase did not have what, you know, the situation that Wells Fargo did. It's not about the money. It's how do you really provide a service to people who need financial services and, and empathy, if you will. You know, I used to say Jamie was a blue collar worker in a white collar. Every Friday, if you wanted to meet him, he's in the lobby sitting there waiting to go to his board meeting in jeans and sneakers. Now the jeans I'm sure were quite expensive, but they were jeans nonetheless. So my point is he was successful because he was available and he was a real person. I mean, he, you know, he's got a twin brother. He he's, came from Greek origin. He's a regular guy and his air is the same air that I breathe. And he made you feel that way. So how do you make somebody feel is half the battle on how you make me feel, right? If I have to say, when I worked at Citigroup, it was different. The CEO had his own elevator, right? When he's walking down the hall, you people part of the seas with Jamie. He's in the elevator with three people having a latte matai, and they don't have to talk to him, or they could. Because at the end of the day, we all came from one place, and we're going to the same place. So while we're here, we might as well just all get along, you know, to, to quote Rodney King, right? Remember yes, that? I agree, I agree. So, you know, and so that's, I learned from just, 
And to me, the reason I gave him my service as the diversity officer, because he had my values. I was just a regular gal just trying to do a good job and maintain my brand and just you know, keep working hard. My mother just work hard, good things will happen, just work hard, respect everybody. How hard is that? Apparently, it's pretty damn hard. It's pretty hard to respect people, you know, if you're getting all these signals, right? And so I try to keep that out of my life as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So here's a question that came up. Uh, it also came up. We had a uh, we have a Rutgers Business School book club. Mm -hmm. Read uh, Just Mercy by yes. Brian Stevenson. Yes. And this question also came up, which I think is very interesting. Pat, do you believe that race is about color or about economics? There are a lot of economic disparities. Parentheses, salaries, promotions, work mobility, etc. Close parentheses that correlate with race and people of color being most marginalized. Yeah, I think when you say race, it includes all of that because at least, you know, if you think about the cities where the majority of the minority is depressed, and I don't mean mentally depressed, although that's part of the issue, but socially depressed, education depressed, even food, you can't find fruits in the Bronx when you go to the food store, right? It's always candies and juice. Like there's just, they don't have what you would say is just what people would think is normal in the suburbs. I think when you say race, it includes Unfortunately, all those tentacles that are part of that person's life. And, you know, you could argue some of them are there doing, some of them are society is doing, and so on and so forth. You know, welfare, right? You know, all that, I think, yes. Um, but most people, when you say race, the first, they see you before they know you. Oh, black person, past judgment. I mean, I have a doctorate. Who would know that? Who would know that? Because I'm not supposed to, because I'm black, right? You're a white woman. I'm thinking, oh, trophy wife. She's got a husband that loves her, a bunch of kids and a dog and a little pet. Because that's what we see on the news. That's the sitcoms, right? Our, our, our whole communications, our whole uh, movies and news and cartoons based upon stereotypes because we love them, right? Unfortunately, when you say stereotype to minority, it's always negative. When you say stereotype about a, a, a white person, it's always positive. It, it, you know, so, but we can be change agents. Change the two feet of space. Everything you touch, eat, wear, and do, make it the world that you want to live in. And before you know it, that'll be the world. But you have to start somewhere, right? You may not see the benefit of your way to build that bridge, but if you don't stop building that bridge, man, I got a longer bridge, bridge to build, right? So everybody has to do something. And I think right now, people are like, well, the leaders. Well, guess what? The leaders are you. The leaders are you. When anybody puts their foot on a Rutgers piece of property, you guys have to have rules of engagement, period, and a story. And if somebody can't raise to that admission and be that person, they don't belong in the school. End of story. You have to be that brave. You have to be that brave. And you know what, Pat? I think that is a great ending note to our discussion. We received so many questions. Um, and I think this was a really great session. I think people really needed this outlet to communicate and to converse. So I really appreciate your time today. I feel so honored uh, that I've had the chance to get to know you better through this webinar. And I, you know, I do look forward to, to keeping in touch with you. I, I want to mention something. So Andrea Cannell uh, shared with us that President Holloway uh, announced yesterday that we as Rutgers University have been awarded a $15 million five-year grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to fund a new university-wide initiative called the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice, a scholarly project with centers based on our New Brunswick, Newark, and Canada campus. I think this is exciting, exciting news. Use that money wisely. Good for mm -hmm. you. Good mm -hmm. for you. Congratulations. That's great. Yeah. That's so very great. exciting. And um, I look forward to our, I thank everybody for, for joining us today, all the faculty and staff. I look forward to our continued conversation in the future. And thank you so much. Have a great day and have a great weekend. Be safe, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Bye-bye.